Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome home to Torah. A warm welcome back to the Yibbana Beit Midrash. We are actually still guests at Eretz Chemda, but that's where we are. And I want to just let everyone know, those who are watching for the first time, this is for serious Bible learners, right? People who want to know what the scripture actually says in the original Hebrew, how to learn. We want to teach you how to learn. Uh, we also want you to learn Hebrew, so we do encourage you to look uh, on down below. In the description box, there is a link where you can find the original Hebrew sheets, which we will be using. I'll be translating it. Um, we use the Kliakar as the basis for our discussion. And um, what I really hope is that you do learn Hebrew, and you can always go back to other classes if you're interested in what other verses say, because we really deal with like one particular verse, one idea, and we expand and we use other verses throughout the Tanakh, and it's a great way for you to, number one, learn Hebrew, um, but really it's to understand the fundamentals, the actual fundamentals that were given over at Mount Sinai to the Jewish people, why we believe what we believe. So we're going to start. This is Parshas Lech Lecha. We're going to read in Genesis chapter 15, verses 7 and 8. The key verse is really verse 8. Eight. Um, you can't escape. But we have to deal with seven anyway, so we'll later on, but we'll we'll bring it up now. So this is Avraham after he is um, he's already in the land of Israel, and we're dealing with a covenant. A covenant we will describe as between the pieces. Brit Bain Habitarim. And in chapter 15, verse 7, he, Hashem said to Avram, he said to him, V'yomer elav, ani Hashem, I am Yudke Vavke, asher hotzei sicha mir kazdim. I'm the one who brought you, hotzei ticha, I brought you out of a place called Ur Kazdim. And why? Letet lecha et haaretz hazot lirishta. In order to give you the land. Now, the next two words are very important. Well, in English, it's uh, two words. Um, to inherit it. Inherit it. Li rishta. Okay, now that's going to be very important. In verse 8, and God said to him, I'm sorry, and, and Avram says back. Now, this is a problem because we deal with it. He says to God, Oh God, Lord, how will I know that I will inherit it? Now, if God said it, who are you, right, to question God? Or is he not questioning God? Is he just asking for a sign so that he knows and he's assured that he will inherit it? Now, the question is, will it be through his seed? And if it's through his seed, why doesn't he ask? We'll see. Why doesn't he ask? Sign me a sign, I'm going to have children. Okay, the question we'll, we will see in a second. Let's just become familiar with the two verses. The first thing God is telling him is, Letet lecha et haaretz hazot lirishta. I'm going to give you the land as an inheritance. But then Avram says back, Bime eda ki arishena. How will I know that I will inherit it? Okay, so the clear car right away. Let's go to the, it's the uh, pages I sent out. It's uh, chapter 15, verse 8. Bime eda ki arishana. How do I know? How will I know? Send me a sign. Give me a promise. And God does. He makes a covenant. But we'll see. Chazal tell us. It's actually in Nadarim 32a. And I think this is very apropos, especially because of... How should I say it? The controversy. There is a controversy in Israel. Should the yeshiva students be drafted? Okay. Should the yeshiva students be drafted? Should the kolel students be drafted? Uh, it could be one of the main reasons why Galant was fired. I'm not saying. It could be. Um, just coincidentally, right? The day after he put out 7,000 uh, draft notices, he lost his job. 
Okay, so it's a hot potato in the government. What does it say in the Darim? Rabbi Abahu said, the Rabbi Eliezer said, for what reason was Abraham our patriarch punished and his children enslaved to Egypt for 210 years? Okay, so this is a question that was posed in the Gemara, in the Talmud, in the Darim 32a. You're not going to like the answer, but in Genesis 14.4, it says, he led forth his trained men, born in his house. The Gemara says, because he made a draft of Torah scholars, as we just stated in this verse, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, to war. He, he, he recruited them for the war. Um, the Gemara says, these trend, trained men that he took to war were actually his disciples who were Torah scholars. Now, we discussed this earlier in the week, that uh, it says that, um, you know, Avraham and Sarah, they made souls. They made souls in Haran. So the Rashi explains there that these were people, non-Jews, of course, nobody was Jewish at the time, but Avraham made them righteous. He trained them. He taught them Torah. They were Torah scholars. Uh, we just discussed last week how Noah himself was a Torah scholar. So I think this should uh, arouse a question from those who are B'nai Noach. Where does it come off? Where is this idea that a Gentile should not learn Torah? Otherwise, there are some very negative consequences. I think that we have to conclude that that statement is not true. In fact, the statement in Hebrew is a akum, an idol worshiper. It's chayim misa if he's oisek betara. But what about, that, that means an idol worshiper. That has negative consequences. But what about a non-Jew who's interested or just deciding, not yet, not, haven't yet decided, but wants to decide a final decision whether to convert to Judaism or not. I meet so many of these people. Obviously, once you have decided, so then you're not in that category, and you're in the process, and you need to learn what it is to be a Jew. So before we get to that, the idea is that, in general, there are a lot of laws that even a Ben Noach, who wants to remain a Ben Noach, who wants to remain a Gentile, can learn a lot of, a lot of Torah. Uh, we discussed this already. Um, one of the laws, one of the seven principles, is to set up court um, uh, ba based in um, and laws to follow. So Choshen Mishpat, which is one fourth of the laws of the Shulchan Aruch are dedicated to civil laws and, and beyond, and there's no reason why a Ben Noach can't learn that part of Judaism. And the Rambam says that any Gentile who wants to keep additional mitzvahs that they're not obligated in can do those mitzvahs as long as they do them correctly. So the idea is like this. First, they have to be oisek in their own Torah, right? There's so much to learn just within the seven Noachide laws. Uh, and they're not even, not, they're not seven laws, they're seven principles. So keeping kosher is something that if they want to do, it's only optional. Keeping Shabbat, I, I say keeping, I should say uh, celebrating Shabbat, not keeping Shabbat, but celebrating Shabbat. They can also learn, especially if they live in a Jewish community, so they can help Jews uh, if they're ever in need of uh, assistance on Shabbat what can be done and what cannot be done and what they can be told to do and what they can't be told to do. Really, there, there's a lot that Gentiles, that B'nai Noach can learn. But a, an akum, an idol worshiper, should not only be discouraged, but be prevented from learning any Torah because all they're doing is looking for uh, ways to counter, uh, to, to fight with the Jewish people and to spread the bad news, so to speak. So getting back to this idea that these people that Abraham made, he made these souls, these are converts into uh, being righteous Gentiles. They were Tamadei Chachamim. This is what the Gemara is saying. And to bring it further, that Tamadei Chachamim should not be drafted into the army. Now, it could be, very simply, there's a difference between an obligatory war and a optional war. So this was to um, to recapture Lot. Lot had been um, had captured and that could be it could be maybe a mandatory war. 
And uh, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty, but there are times, of course, where Torah scholars may have to fight. Uh, but during an optional war, uh, they don't. It could very well be that Israel, ever since its, um, what's the word, its conception in 1948, I mean the modern state of Israel, it could be that we have been fighting for our existence, and it could be that, uh, that it's a mandatory war. However, <laughs> I have to say that even the army themselves have said that they're not prepared. They're not prepared for this uh, onslaught, uh, what's the word, uh, recruitment of uh, all these yeshiva guys. So we're going to put that aside. Just know what we're dealing with here, that Avraham in this Brit, Bain of Batarim, even though there's a covenant being made over the land of Israel, it's very important to know that Avraham, we're going to put this in perspective now, when he said, how will I know that I will inherit it? The Gemara is claiming this is what he did that deserved the punishment. But how was he punished? His children were punished for 400 years. If 400 years of going into Egypt and becoming slaves, the, the, the way the, um, the clear card is going to express the question is, it's something here doesn't make sense. Avram did a sin, such as ask God for a sign when he should have had faith and not questioned. And if that's true, then shouldn't the punishment go on him? Why is it then on his, on his family and his children? And the Gemara seems to answer that, um, see that what was it that he did? Number one, that he recruited Torah scholars. And then we're going to discuss what it exactly, what, what was the measure for measure, what the punishment was that Abraham had to experience because of this particular sin. Okay, so let's go into the clear car. We didn't even begin, but here we go. So he, the clear car begins with verse 8. How will I know? Like, give me a sign. How will I know that I will inherit it? And Chazal say, and we just read the Gemara, Bavor Sha'amar Avraham Bima Eda. On account of the fact that Avram said, how do I know that I will inherit it? He was punished with, and we're going to go now to verse 13. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. When God says to Avram, and he said to Avram, Biomer la Avram, his name is Avram still, Yodea teda, whenever there's a double language of you will surely know, that's how we're going to translate it. No, you shall know. Literally, no, you shall know. Um, basically means you will surely know. And the answer is your seed will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and they will enslave them and oppress them for 400 years. So immediately after Avram asked the question, how will I know that I will inherit it? A few verses later, God is now telling him, now I always use the word promise. This was a covenant and it's related to the land. God, Avram wants to know, how will I know that I'm going to inherit the land and my children will inherit as well? And so this is part of the promise. First, they have to go into slavery. They're going to go into a land that's not theirs. And for what purpose? And let me explain. This is not what the Kliakar says, but basically a concept that we became royal slaves. Remember that Yosef, in his genius, uh, during the, um, the days of famine, right? There were seven good years, and then there were supposed to be seven bad years. It only lasted two years until Yaakov came down to Egypt. Then it stopped. But there was uh, the beginning of the, uh, during the good years, during the good years, Yosef, um, what's the word? He stored away. They, they, he used his brain, right? They stored away all that they could for the bad days. And when the bad days arrived, People ran out of food. I'm talking about Egyptians, of course, all over the world. Even that's how uh, the, the sons came down to try to find Yosef because they used the excuse they can then buy food there. But going back to this idea, going back to this idea that it was really a promise, this is how I usually explain it, but we have to understand there obviously was a punishment, and that's what we're going to discuss, but the promise that this land will be yours, and so you went from being... Slaves, now, let me explain. 
when Yosef started to distribute during the first two years the food, and people had run out of food, he then used eminent domain, so to speak. He, he basically said, listen, you don't have food, give me your property. If you give me your property, we'll take care of you. So basically, almost all of Egypt, they became, right, the, the Egyptians themselves became slaves to Pharaoh. They became slaves to Pharaoh. So then when we became slaves, who were we? We were slaves in the individual houses, but they didn't own us. We were royal slaves of Pharaoh. Okay, so in other words, the, the, the regular Egyptian dude, family, whatever you want to call them, right, persons, they were um, mishubad. They, they had like basic liens on their property. And so when we came down to Egypt and we eventually became slaves, we weren't slaves of the individual people. As the concept says that an owner and a slave, the slave finds something or acquires something, it's really the owner that acquires it. So even though we were working as slaves in individual homes, we were royal slaves. So it could be the foundation for us to become royal slaves to God. We first had to understand what it meant to be a royal slave. Okay, that's one idea, was that we actually had to be cleansed. We like They, they, they used the word the crucible, an iron crucible in Egypt. Um, so to go through the pain and the suffering was a cleansing process in order for us to come out purified when we finally left Egypt. Okay, so that Rashi is very interesting on that verse 13. Should know when it says 400 years, what is, what is 400 years? How was it? It's 400 years from the birth of Isaac. Isaac was born, by the way, um, Isaac was 40 years old when he married. Okay, we're going to try to figure out how there was 400 years. 400 years from the birth of Isaac. And Isaac was a nomad. And Yaakov also was a sojourner. And, and Avram was a sojourner. So they didn't really have a settlement in the land. They were like Gerim. So from the time Isaac was born, so Isaac was 40 years old when he finally married. Um, and in chapter 25, verse 26... Is that right? Yeah. Um, it literally says that Yaakov and Esau were born when Isaac was um, 60. So, okay, so now we have a timeline. He was 60, fine. And when, when Yaakov went down to Egypt, he uh, Pharaoh asked him how old he was. He said he was 130 years old. So 60 when he was born, Yaakov. Um, I'm sorry, when Isaac gave birth to Yaakov, Isaac was 60, plus the 130 years. So that's 190 years when Yaakov went down to Egypt. And they were in Egypt for 210 years. And uh, the numerical value of Radu, when it says that he went down to Egypt um, in chapter 42, verse 2 of Genesis, the word redu, the gematria, is 210. So 210 plus 190, that's 400 years. Okay? It's 400 years. Okay. And that's how we get to 400 years. Let's go back into the clear car. The point here is that Avram said, how will I know? And he was punished. You will surely know. That was the answer God gave him. You want to know? You're really going to know. And the 400 years was the punishment. So the question is, the clear card says, It's hard to comprehend. It's almost impossible. It's very difficult. Basically, it means the seichel rejects. Okay? The intellect rejects this to accept this as an answer because of the next question. The oinish gadol kazeh ba'avur ha'ot Shasha'al Avraham, that the children are caused to suffer such a great punishment on account of the sign that Avraham asks doesn't make sense. The Avraham Atzmo, Lo Kibel Shum Onish, that Avraham himself is not going to receive a punishment. The Shine Bonav Tik Hena, and that the, ch the children's um, teeth are going to like um, be set on edge. 
It doesn't make sense, the Kliyakar says. Really? Okay, so we don't see that much of a punishment for Avram, but we see a great amount of punishment, 400 years, that your, um, your progeny is going to be in a land that is not theirs, and they're going to be enslaved and afflicted. Al Kain Libi Oimer Vagoimer. Therefore, the Kliakar is saying, My heart s- speaks, my heart says. And you can actually learn. Shigalut Mitzrayim Hayu Kol Sibot Acherot. The real reason for the exile of Egypt has to be for other reasons. It doesn't make sense, he says. And Venichlichu Bo Rabbosenu Zal. There's actually an argument amongst the, the rabbis. Why were we, I'm going to use the word punished or promised to be in a land that's not ours, such as Egypt, for 400 years, for a long time. And he says you can find that the Abarbanel brings down so many different opinions. He's known for that. But the Kliakar says, Ki yodo kitzvam, even though he compiled them, the Abarbanel, Rabbi Yitzhak Abarbanel compiled them, that there's not enough paper <laughs> to write basically all these ideas. Literally means the curtain is not long enough to record all the different opinions. However, what was difficult for these, this author of this medrash was basically Yehatam El Galut Mashiach. That basically, whatever the reason is, it, it's almost irrelevant. The real question that bothers, Lama Zehigit HaKadosh Baruch Hu Besor Ara Zul Avram Litzaro Bechinam. This is going to be the question. Why did Hashem tell over to Abraham that his children are going to be slaves for 400 years? Right? Why did Hashem tell this over? Why did he relate this bad news? Um, what, just to cause Avraham pain? Is that what it was? So just to sum that question up, it seems like what's bothering the Kliakar, explaining the, the Medrash itself, that it seems like the question re- stands like this. Why would Hashem relate this bad news to Avraham if Avraham himself is not being punished, but his children are? Why does God relate this bad news? Is it just to cause um, needless pain? Is that the punishment? And so the Kliakar says, Yep, yeah, Al Ze'ama, regarding this, the very sin, Shaba'avon, Bime'eda, the sin was that he asked, Send me a sign, how will I know? So, Shorotza Leda Dava, Shalohaya Botsarik Leda. He was requesting information of something that he did not need to know. Not required to know. God said, I give this as an inheritance. This is the land of Israel. The whole world is fighting about it. Everybody wants it. This is going to be a key. It's going to be key. Because we have to understand why Avram actually asked the question to start with. But right now we're asking, why was, what, why was his children punished? And he wasn't really punished. So it says, Kimalo levakesh os adavar Hashem. Why would he ask a sign when God said, this is it, this is it. You got no worries, right? Trust me. Okay, Nenash, therefore, he was punished, Yodoteda, by God saying, you will surely know. Therefore, measure for measure, we're going to talk about Mida, Keneg, and Mida. When we get a punishment called measure for measure, it's not for the punishment's sake. It's so that you learn and you, you fix yourself. How do you know what you did wrong? Because God sends you a personalized, customized message. You will figure it out. This is for people who are on a high level, right? People who are of the prophetic variety, right? If you're using your intelligence, you're using your mind, you're using your connection with God, you'll be able to figure it out because the punishment, I'm using parentheses, the so-called punishment matches the crime and then you're able to figure out what it was you did wrong. You're like a God send you, sending you a, a personalized message, wake up, see what you did wrong, and you could figure out how to fix it because you can only figure out how to fix it if you know what you did wrong. So the punishment 
again, it's, it's, a love, it's a love tap. It's, it's God saying, I love you. I want you to fix yourself. So I'm sending you a personalized, customized message. And so therefore, he asked, I want to know. And God said, you will surely know. He shouldn't have asked. Um, so Kaddish Baruch Hu actually did inform him of something that would cause him pain in order for him to figure out that this is what he did wrong. And that's the summary of the first paragraph. Um, now we're going to get into the idea of the sign itself. Why was Avraham interested to know uh, what motivated him? Not necessarily. We understand that he was punished, but the punishment was not so severe. The punishment, as we know, was just the knowing that he shouldn't have asked and that he should have trusted Hashem. So, regarding this very idea of the sign that Avram had asked, Tamu Rabim, there are many that wonder about this. Lamashal Ot al Yerusha Ta'aretz. Why did this? Okay, so we're getting to the root of the crux of the question. Why was it so important for Avram to know by God sending him a sign that this was an inheritance? This land, right, as I think we all say nowadays, from the river to the sea, Israel will be free. Is that, is that what I've been hearing? Something like that. Yeah. So basically, La Mishal Ot Al Yerusha Ta'aretz. Why did he ask regarding the sign, uh, regarding, uh, relating to the inheritance of the land? V'lo Shal Ot Al Haftachat Hazera. Why didn't he ask about a sign regarding a promise for seed? I mean, he was an older gentleman, 75, and he didn't have any children. So what's going on? So the clear car says, Va'ani Shoel od Sheila Achas. You know what? I'm going to ask an additional question, he says. Lama lo sha'al od al ha'aretz miyad? Kish'amr lo kadosh baruchu ba'pam rishon. Look in chapter 12, verse 7. So it's number five on the source sheet. And the Lord appeared to Avram and he said, To your seed I will give this land. Now what's the word attain? I will give. It sounds like it's a matana. Matana means a gift. And if you go back to source number four, but it's not in order because that's Genesis 12. See, in Genesis 15, in our, ver in our chapter, he says, I'm going... Who's going to inherit, inherit, okay? But the one who will spring from your innards, he will inherit you, right? So it's not Eliezer of Damascus, but it's, it's uh, Isaac, Yitzhak. He's going to inherit, sorry, um, Yishmael. It's not Yishmael, but it's Yitzhak. Okay. Ki'im asher yetzei mima'echo hu yirushecha. It's the one who is going, going to come from your seed. And in, earlier on in chapter 12, he promises, to your seed, I will give this land. So as we will see, there's a difference between a matana, which is latate, a gift, and something that's called an inheritance, a yerusha. Keep that in mind, those two words. So the Kleokar continues and he says, after he quotes the verse, it's the third line down in that paragraph, Lizaracha attain et ha'aretz. To your seed I will grant, gift, this land. Gam bisfekot elu rabo hadeos. Well, guess what? According to the Kleokar, even this question, there are going to be many opinions. Ani Omer, so the Kleokar is telling you his own opinion. He says, Shaha'ot asher sha'alo, lo shahoy avraham mesupach, biyiud ha'kel yisbrach that the very idea of the sign uh, which he asked, Avram was not in really any doubt as to the promise. So we're judging Avram more favorably here. Avram was not in doubt about the promise. So what was the issue? Zulat shiratza shiikrot lo hakadosh baruch hu brit. He really wanted that God basically make a contract that would be unbreakable. 
Okay? When you give a gift, okay, it's a gift. You know, people, they're not going to say too much. But if, if it's a Yerusha, once you say it's a Yerusha, it's an inheritance, it's forever, it's never going to be broken. Avram was afraid there are going to be people that are going to come and say, I want a part of it. And what kind of people? Well, we'll see. People who might have a claim on it. The Can Canaanites do not have a real claim. We call it Eretz Canaan. Why do we call it Eretz Canaan? So if you try to imagine, Noah had three sons, right? And the world was distributed to the three sons. Shame, he acquired all of Asia. Yafet, he acquired Europa, Europe. And Ham, third son, he acquired Africa. The Canaanites, Canaan is a son of Ham. So they, they extended out of Africa and they came and, well, I don't know what you want to say, they uh, appropriated the land here. Because it's then called Eretz Canaan because they were here. But they, that's not, this is part of Asia. Eretz Israel is part of Asia. So Avram was concerned more about Shem, the children of Shem, that they might have a claim because it's part of Asia. Well, let's see. The, uh, the Kleokar says um, that Avram wanted to sheikrot brit. He wanted to uh, seal a covenant, to enter a covenant with God to remove upon the land any claim or protest over us being here because God made a, a, a promise that your seed will inherit it and that it is an inheritance. Once you have an inheritance, that's why you have, what do they call that? A will. You know, and it has to be um, verified, right? Is it really the person's signature? Was he, when he signed it, was he under, what do you call it, uh, a healthy mind and body, no pressure, right? So there's a contract. And that's what Avraham wanted, a contract, so there will not be any of uh, anyone who was, would try to make a rightful claim. You know, not a rightful claim. They think they have a rightful claim, but uh, a claim. See, pre, prior, back in chapter 12, verse 7, lamala amarlo, as we just read in 12, verse 7, God said, to your seed I will give this land. Attain. What's attain? It's mashma matana ba'alma. A matana attain. No attain. A matana is a gift. That it was just a gift. That's what people might say. For that, you know, there's no point in entering covenant. It's just, just a gift. Who, who's concerned about any type of protest or claim on a gift that God gave? As it says in Psalms chapter 50, verse 12, for the world belongs to Hashem and all of its fullness. So there's no, um, he can give it to whoever he wants. It's within God's power and ability to give to whomever he wants. By the way, just to think about the first Rashi in, in all of the Torah, Rabbi Yitzhak, Rashi says, Rabbi Yitzhak would say, um, why does the Torah begin with the whole story of Breshit leading up to uh, the creation of the Jewish people? And so he, he does answer, a lengthy answer, but one of the ideas is that it's in order to teach the world that God created the world and he decides who gets what land. This is very important because wars have been fought over land. And in the ancient days, of course, many of the, what's the word, the city, the capital cities of these lands were named after their gods, as if their god is the one who is ruling over the land. I'm not going to get into this whole idea of whether it's idol worship or a recognition of some kind of um, intermediary, but the idea that everyone can recognize is that whoever won the war and took over land it's a proof that their God is stronger, right? That's the way the world worked at the time. 
And, and therefore, that's what it means in Psalms chapter 50, verse 12. For the world and its fullness are mine, belongs to Hashem. And so going back to the, the Rashi over there, the first Rashi in Breshit, that he actually says, it's like Mamish prophetic, but it's not him. He's quoting from even earlier sources that why is it so necessary, necessary to show you the creation of the world? It could have just started from the first halacha that was ever given to the Jewish people of the Korban Pesach before we left Egypt. This is the first month to you, and then 14 days later, uh, 10 days later, and then 14 days later, all that. Why is it necessary to start with Genesis? To show you that God is the creator of the world. He's the one who decides who, where, and what. So everyone knows that, even deep inside, even if you're an idol worshiper, you all know that the power of, of God is the one that determines the outcome of the wars. But afterwards, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to him in chapter 15, verse 7, which is our verse, So originally it was a gift in chapter 12. Chapter 15, it's called an inheritance. Mashma, what does this infer? Shinatina Zu Shehiskir, that the original gift in verse chapter 12, verse 7, is really uh, mentioning a Torah Yerusha, the laws of inheritance, not a gift. And if you think about it, Lefisha Noach Chilek Haaretz Levanav, since Noach had divided. He divided and he apportioned the world according to his sons, right? As I mentioned, Shem gets Asia, Yafet gets Europe, Ham gets um, Africa. Natan Aretz, Canaan, live no shame. And the land of Canaan, we're calling it Canaan because they, the Canaanites were here, but it's Asia, has no shaykhs. It's not related at all to Ham or to his child Canaan, but that's the land that he's giving to the children of shame. That's us, the Jewish people. And you, God saying you are coming, it's coming to you by the laws, by the uh, reality of inheritance. So then what did Avram think? As chash of Avram, you know what? Shh, um, Shema Sha'ar Yerushav Shel Shem Ya'ar'aru Al Chelkam. That it could be, perhaps, in the future, um, other um, children of shame might come and make a, a, a claim on their portion. It was never a portion to Canaan. They had no claim on it at all. God gave it to them, as Rashi says, in the beginning, not in the beginning of time, but when they took it over before the Jewish people came to be. And God took it away from them and gave it to us. That's the way it works. God is the Almighty. Okay, so it could be. And who is like, if you look at Asia, I mean, India is a pretty big country. And it's pretty central. So is Iran. I mean, I don't, I don't know if Iran has any claims on this land. But through Islam, they certainly do. Right? Um, Islam makes a claim that any place that they had under their rulership at any given time has a certain uh, status, and there has to be jihad, that's what they call it, in order to uh, free it up. So there are claims by Islam. Anyway, B'nai Shem, there's a verse in chapter 10, verse 22. And uh, Look at number 7 on the source sheet, just so we should know. The sons of Shem were Elam, Ashur, this is a hard word, but this is the word we're dealing with. Arpachshad, Arpachshad, as well as Lud and Aram. And who is, right? We see these are the gener chapter, that was chapter 10, verse 22. Look in Genesis chapter 11, verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old, and he begot Arpachshad two years after the flood. Okay, so... Or Pakshad. This is the verse we're dealing with. And Abraham Yotze Min Arpakshad. So this is the one 
This is the lineage of Avraham. He comes from Arpakshad. Shema Sha'ar B'nei Shem Ya'aru Al HaYishrusha. So Avraham was concerned that maybe one day in the future that one of the other children of shame, other Asian people, are going to uh, make some kind of a claim on this land, on this land that was given as an inheritance. Uh, Kain Amar, that's why it says in chapter 15, verse 8, this is the first, one of the first verses we said, ki When Avram says, how will I know that I inherited it? How do I know? You know give me a sign. So this sign was the covenant. He wanted a covenant. So there won't be any um, any any protest. Mahaot shani lavad hayoresh bli arur. What sign can you give me that I alone will know? That I alone will know um, that there won't be any protest. Now I want to just stop for a second because there are protests, but how will I know that their protests are fake? This is so important. Um, I have a beautiful picture in my living room by the artist uh, Nakshon from Hebron, and it's part of the Medrash. The Medrash says, says that the, um, there are three places in Eretz Israel where the Gentiles will not make a claim that you are thieves. And guess what? These three places the Medrash mentions, and it's beautiful in the picture, are exactly the places they make the claim. It's Hebron, right? That was bought by Avraham, right? From the, uh, the pe- from the from the people in Hebron, and you have Harabayit that was bought by David from Aravna Jebusi, and then you have Shechem, the burial place of Yosef, which was bought by Yaakov. So, very interestingly enough. The very three places the Medrash says they will not make a claim is the very place that they make a claim. So the, the Medrash is saying it, it's not that they're not going to claim. Of course they're going to claim. I want an os. I want my children to know that this is ours. And the answer is you're going to be 400 years in Egypt. And we were 400 years in Egypt and we were enslaved. Okay, so this is the os. But the os is even greater than that. Listen to how the Kleokar finishes up this idea. Ubalo Chuva. So this is uh, four lines up from the bottom of this paragraph that God gave him the answer. And that's the very following verse, verse 9. Right? We had in verse um, we had in verse 7 where God says, I'm going to give you the land to inherit it. Verse 8, um, Mo, um, Avram says, How will I know will I inherit it? And verse 9 says, bring korbanos, bring these offerings. That's it? Well, there's a lot of depth in these offerings in the Brit Bain of a time, the covenant between the parts. But the Kleokar says, this is the answer God gives him. Kechali egala mishuleshet. Right? Uh, verse 9, do I have it here? Yeah. It's number 10 on the source sheet. Bring me three high heifers, and three goats, and three rams and a turtle dove, and a young bird. Okay, we're going to discuss this shortly um, on the last page in English, the Rashi. But before we do, um, just to finish up this paragraph, Kederach shekarat Hashem li Aaron brit melech olam. So if you look in Genesis, I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 18, verse 19. It's number 11 on the source sheet. So all of the gifts of the holy offerings are set aside by the children of Israel. And that's going to be the gifts to the Kohanim and the Levi'im. Um, and, well, here it's the Kohanim. And to your sons and daughters with you as an eternal portion. So in Hebrew, right? Lachok olam, as an eternal covenant, as an eternal statute. Bris Melach, a, a covenant of salt. But it says, Olam He, meaning it's eternal. And it's for you and your descendants. So the idea that these korbanos, this was the idea that we're bringing korbanos, and a portion of that goes to the Kohanim. 
There's a covenant of salt. What does salt represent? Salt always represents something that, well, we do know, brings out the best taste in things, but it also is a preserver. It prever- preserves things. Um, should I just read the Rashi there? Uh, all the gifts of the holy offerings, because the passage is so cherished, it's generalized at the beginning, generalized at the end, with details in the middle. That's all about the whole paragraph. But it's an eternal covenant of salt. Hashem enacted a covenant with Aaron, with an object that is wholesome and lasting and keeps other foodstuffs wholesome. So it's, it's preservative, but a covenant of salt like a covenant made with salt that it should never spoil. Okay, so it's preservative, but it lasts forever. It's a symbolic of eternality. Okay, so too, back here, when God is making this covenant with Avraham, um, he's telling him to bring these korbanos. Just like the covenant was sealed with Aaron with a salt um, covenant forever, and what's the point? Over there too, Lesalik Malav Iru Shakarach. There was a, a, a battle, so to speak, a, uh, a confrontation, a revolution. This group of people wanted the kahuna. They wanted to usurp the authority of Aaron and Moshe, of course. And at the end of the day, God makes a covenant with Aaron. Nobody can make a claim on making a, uh, a covenant and a sign that you cannot um, argue against. You know that it's yours. Um, and the clear card continues, This is exactly the same reason that God made a covenant with Avram. In order to remove any claim or protest. Obviously, it doesn't mean to remove the claim. From them, it means to remove the claim from us that we will know. I, 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 I beg every Jew out there, you're religious, you're not religious, you're uh, secular, you're lefty, you're who knows what you are, it doesn't matter. No, this land belongs to us, right? If you're not even from coming from a religious point of view, just take a look at history. You want to deny history, Right? We don't, we don't deny history. We don't, de- we don't deny the facts. The facts are well, this is our ancient homeland. In fact, this idea of splitting up animals and separating them, this was an ancient custom. And uh, this is how people made covenants, contracts back then. And I want to go into the Rashi on chapter 15, verse 10, where Avraham divided them into two parts. Um, one, the ideas. A simple meaning, he was forming a covenant with him to keep his promise to cause his sons to inherit the land. This is what Rashi says, and it's based on verse 18. Chapter 18, verse 18, in Numbers. Uh, If I'm not wrong, right. It says, on that day, the Lord formed a covenant with Avram. So this is very important. On that day, the Lord formed a covenant with Avram, saying, To your seed I have given this land from the river of Egypt until the great river, the Euphrates River. So the Euphrates River is all the way somewhere in Iraq. That's right. Okay? It is what it is. And the river of Egypt, some say it is a river that runs through the middle of Gaza. Some say it means it's the river that is in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula, and there is an opinion that it actually goes to what they call the Suez Canal, as far as the Nile. Um, but anyway, it goes all the way to the Euphrates River. Biomahu karat Hashem et Avram brit lemor lezarcha netati et haaretz hazot min har mitzrayim the, the nahar mitzrayim ad hanar hagado. Nahar Parat. Parat is the Euphrates River. So just to get an idea, the rest of this Rashi on 1510, that it was the custom of those to, who form a covenant to divide an animal to pass between its parts. You can see in Jeremiah chapter 34, 19, this was an idea. Um, but the different animals actually represent different kingdoms. 
So, but he did not divide the birds. Let's see the Rashi. Since the idol-worshipping nations are likened to bulls, rams, and goats. You can see in Psalms 22, 13. Many bulls surrounded me. Okay, so the Jews are surrounded by the non-Jews as bulls. And Daniel chapter 8, verse 20. And 21. The ram that you saw, the one with horns, represents the kings of Midia and Persia. And, and, and then in, that was 20. And then in 21. And the he-goat is the king of Greece. Well, that's why we split them. There's a downfall. Whereas the Israelites, as it says, the birds are not um, divided. How, do we, how are the Jews compared to doves? So in Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 14, my dove in the clefts of the rock. It's talking about the Israelites. And the, the Rashi says, therefore he divided the animals. That's an allusion to the nations that will gradually perish. But he did not divide the bird, as the verse says, and this is an illusion that Israel, who is compared to the dove, will exist forever. Um, we just finished Sukkot, and as you know, that the 70 bulls, which represent the nations, are diminished. So, like we understand on Sukkot, like I said, the bulls represent the nations. And we start with a lot and we go down to seven. We start out with 13 and each day is diminished one of them. Uh, like on Hanukkah, right, there's a whole dispute. How do we light? The, we're coming up to Hanukkah. Do we light going up in the ascension order because each day is we go up in holiness? Or according to Shammai, we go down. We don't paskin like that, but he would hold that you light eight lights on the first night and then you go down to seven, and then to six, till the last night you light one. And he relates it back to Sukkot. That's how he holds. Okay, We don't do that on, on Hanukkah. But on, on Sukkot, we all agree that the bulls represent the nations. The nations, they want rain. I think last week, I, the, 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 the title of the shir was, actually it wasn't my shir, but many of the shirms last week was, I will bless those who bless you. Ah, That was, I think, Rabbi Brady was shir on Tuesday night. So if you come and you come to Yerushalayim and you recognize the God of Israel and you recognize Israel's right to exist because you believe the Bible's true, so you could be a righteous Noahide and Bezrat Hashem, your land, if you represent your people, will, uh, what's the word? Will be blessed with rain. And uh, this past week's events, whether you like it or not, the United States of America did vote in, the, 45th, uh, the 47th president of the United States, uh, as Donald J. Trump, who, in my opinion, my humble opinion, is that he definitely is blessing the Jewish people, and I think he recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, as far as I, I know, and Bezrat Hashem, there should be a lot of bracha and hatzlacha to America these coming years, and of course they can shower those blessings on us, right? I'll put it as a place you can donate, to Yibaneh, so we can continue to carry these messages far and wide. Um, so this is it. If you really think about it, our message that this land is inheritance, it's for us to know. Of course, any God-believing, Bible-thumping non-Jew will understand that is the truth, but it's for every Jew. I have so many old friends, people I grew up with, who are uh, of the Kamala Harris uh, camp, very, very emotionally distraught, um, going into a, uh, a panic mode. And I want to assure you that um, you should really check out your Jewish roots and the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and to their descendants. And um, this is a good choice. And Bezrat Hashem, I'll sign off wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom and a great life and a good winter. And we'll see you next week.